I guess it's obvious that I'm filling in for Adam again today. Uh, the good news is that I've been to the doctor and he tells me that he has a solution for my split personality. And uh, I think things will go back to normal very soon. Uh, we are today picking up on our Mark series and we're looking at the last part of chapter two and chapter three as Jenny read for us earlier. The Gospel of Mark starts very clearly by stating its pur purpose. This is the good news about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Mark wants you to know that Jesus is the Son of God and to understand exactly what that means. So I wanted to start today by looking at the big picture, pulling us into where Mark is. Jesus spoke about God's kingdom 126 times in the four Gospels. That's a lot. And very early in Mark, Jesus says that the kingdom of God is near. It's why Jesus is here and Jesus is the king. He has authority over all things. And in the early part of Mark, he establishes the authority of Jesus as God's king. And our passage today follows on from that. So that's our basis for what we're looking at today. The original title for today's sermon was Expect Rejection and Acceptance. The more I worked with the passage, the more I thought that that's just another way of saying there are only two ways to live. There were two choices then and there are two choices now, accept or reject. Accept Jesus as king and serve him and be part of his kingdom or reject him and oppose him as king. And in this passage, we're going to see both of those things happen. Jesus is ushering in his kingdom and he's teaching that in this kingdom, things are different. In God's kingdom, things are different. And so you need to change your way of thinking. You need to change your way of living. God's kingdom is like no other. It's a kingdom based on grace and love where the king gives so that we might live where we become children of the king and heirs to the kingdom. All who believe will freely receive through grace. Some will struggle to understand and accept it because it's the opposite of what the world teaches. The world tells us that we have to work to achieve. Jesus says, believe and you will have everlasting life. How can we as mere mortals get our head around something so amazing? And on our own, we can't. We need God to help us to get our heads around that, to get our heads around just how amazing that is. I'm going to pray for us now that, uh, that indeed we can do that. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together as your people. Thank you that you have established your kingdom in our hearts. As we explore your word today, help us to understand. Help us to comprehend simple concepts that are so amazing that they are difficult to comprehend without you opening our hearts and minds. So, Father, we pray that you will do that, that you will open our hearts and minds. We know that you are an amazing God and that through you all things are possible. And we know that because of your love and grace that you sent your son Jesus to die for us and that he rose again so that we can have eternal life with you. Help us to understand what it means to live for you and to put our trust in you so that we can truly be your children. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All through the Bible... Uh, we see a distinction between the things of the flesh, that is, if you per prefer the things of the earth, the worldly things, and the things of the spirit, or if you prefer the things of God, flesh versus spirit, human versus God. There's our two choices. 
We must choose which kingdom we will serve. Two ways to live. You can choose to accept God's kingdom or you can choose to oppose it. And to be very clear, not choosing is the same as choosing to reject it. There are only two choices. There's no fence sitting. So everybody is one or the other. You, you either accept God's kingdom or you reject it. And in today's passage, we're going to see a little bit of both, hence the title. We're going to look at three incidents that involve some very provocative questions, questions that will show that Jesus is God, questions that will show that he's in control, but they require you to think beyond your own human logic. I encourage you to listen carefully to God's word and to allow God to open your hearts through his Holy Spirit. I encourage you to keep the passage open in front of you. Uh, we'll basically be working our way through that. And so if you've got it there in front of you, uh, you will find that helpful to be able to refer to it. To understand what's happening in these verses, we need to understand some background. Judaism began with Abraham about 1,800 years before Jesus and the Ten Commandments about 1,400 years before Jesus. So a lot of Jewish religious culture has been around for a long time and therefore it's culture that's deeply embedded in people's lives. So like most things that are deeply embedded, I'm sure that there's a lot of things that they did just because that's the way they've been doing it for 1,400 years. And I suspect for many of them, uh, they did it without even thinking about it. God's kingdom brings a whole new perspective to this culture, brings a whole new perspective to the rules that they were applying. And Jesus was trying to open their eyes to a new way of thinking, thinking God's way. Now, for some, this is a relief, and for others, it's confronting, and for some, it's difficult to accept. It's different. It's different to the way they're used to thinking. Now, I have the great privilege of caring for my grandson, Bailey, before school every day. So for nearly two hours every morning, five days a week, I entertain, feed, dress him, make sure he brushes his teeth and all the rest of it to make sure he gets to school on time and ready for a big day of learning. Now, as wonderful as this is, uh, it doesn't come without challenges. I sometimes find myself saying to Bailey, Bailey, do you believe that Grandpa loves you? Of course, Grandpa will say. So if Grandpa asks you to do something, do you believe that it's for your own good, even if it's something that you don't want to do? And usually I get a very reluctant yes, and sometimes I even get a change of attitude. The description of us as God's children is so appropriate because it's so much like our real lives. It's the same with us and God. We need to acknowledge that when God asks us to do something, it's because it's the best for us. Even, and I can't stress this enough, even if we don't fully understand it. We need to trust God. His way is right. If God tells us to do something, we can be 100% confident that it's the right thing and it's the best thing for us. So when people ask Jesus why his disciples don't fast, he tells them, you don't go to a wedding expecting to fast. It's a celebration. And at a celebration, you enjoy a good feast, not McDonald's. He's the bridegroom and we are his people. We're the bride. And so while Jesus is with his disciples, there's no need to fast. They're with God. They're with Jesus. No need to fast. 
The purpose of fasting is to focus our attention on our relationship with God. It was an expected discipline in both the Old and New Testament years. And it was then and still is now a good thing at the right time. But Jesus is saying, they don't need to draw near to God. I'm God and I'm right here. It's time to celebrate. We then get this passage about wine and wineskins. Now, I know this passage is a little bit strange to us because it's not how we do things now. I mean, the closest thing to wineskins that we see these days is this. And it's not the same, is it? This wine cast has been around for 50 years, so it's been around for a long time, but 50 years is a drop in the ocean in terms of the Jewish culture. And, of course, our wine comes pre-fermented. They had to ferment their own. They put grape juice into wine skins to ferment it and turn it into, into wine. It's just basic physics. When you put wine into wine skins, it stretches. So you can't mix old and new. You can't put new wine into wine into old wine skins, or both the wine and the wine skins will be ruined. If you put new wine into old wine skins, it'll burst and both will be lost. New wine needs new wine skins. We also see that passage about mending uh, old clothes with, with new cloth. And of course, the new cloth will uh, shrink. And again, the garment will be ruined. The illustration here is that God's kingdom is the new wineskin. The old Jewish rules is the old wine. They don't belong in God's kingdom. The new kingdom that Jesus is bringing, we need new wine. There's a move from law to grace. The law and works don't fit together with the grace of the gospel. Jesus is bringing a new message of grace. And this message is reinforced in the following two stories about working on the Sabbath. Now, again, we need to understand the Jewish perception of the Sabbath, Sabbath and the long history of observing it. The purpose of the Sabbath, which is an appropriate one, is to make time to focus on our relationship with God, to be deliberate about setting time aside to acknowledge and worship our great God. It goes all the way back to Exodus. And the fourth commandment requires rest on the Sabbath from routine work, including the gathering of manna, cooking, and the kindling of fire. Now, to give you an idea of how serious the relationship between the Jewish people and God was to be taken, a violation of the Sabbath regulation attracted the death penalty. That's a pretty serious consequence, isn't it? It's also appropriate in terms of us thinking about what happens if we get our relationship with God wrong. Numbers, the book of Numbers, that is, not the numbers that I like. Uh, I mean, I do like the book of Numbers, but the book of Numbers describes the stoning of a man who gathered wood on the Sabbath, and it's not the only time that that's happened. Now, basic Jewish regulations give us 39 basic laws that need to be observed on the Sabbath, basically a list of things that you're not allowed to do. Now, I'm not going to leave that up there long enough for you to look at every single one, but you get the gist you can't tie or untie. You can't sew. You can't cook. You can't tear. You can't build. You can't demolish. You can't build fires. You can't put out fires. 39 rules. Now, I'm not an expert uh, on this, but, in fact, I'd, I'd say I'm pretty much a novice in this kind of thing. But uh, what I can say is that the big picture 
that I see here is that there's not very much that you can do without getting into trouble. Now, what might astound you even more than these basic 39 rules is that the Pharisees managed to add, add another 1,500 rules. Now, I don't know how you remember 1,500 rules, uh, let alone obey them all. You couldn't even take more than 99 steps outside your house on the Sabbath. So it's really helpful if you live very close to the synagogue. Now, the ridiculousness of these rules turned what God had intended to be a day of rest and celebration into a day of stress. Can you imagine having to follow all those rules with the threat of death over your head? Clearly not what God had intended. The disciples picked some heads of grain. Now, I presume they were hungry, but under the rules of the Sabbath, this was work and it was unlawful, something that the Pharisees were very quick to point out. And Jesus reminds them that even David, King David, who's revered amongst all Jewish people, ate consecrated bread when he was hungry and in need. Jesus reminds them that the Sabbath was made for man, not the man for Sabbath. And the Son of Man, that is God, that is him, is Lord of even the Sabbath. We then see the incident in chapter 3 where Jesus heals a man in the synagogue on the Sabbath. He's not trying to hide what he's doing. He's trying to help them understand God's kingdom and how their rules have consequences outside of God's plan. Jesus has come and God is changing the ground rules. The opening words in this passage are another time. So this presumably doesn't follow on directly from the previous incident with the grain, but it's connected in that it's making a very similar point. And the Pharisees are watching to see what he would do. Would he heal on the Sabbath? And Jesus knows what they're thinking, and so he asks them a very provocative question. Which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? He knows that they've lost sight of what the Sabbath is all about that they've lost their relationship with God. They're just going through the motions, ticking the boxes. And so he looks at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. Jesus wants them to see the love that God has for them, but they're too stubborn to see it and accept it. Now, this topic of stubborn hearts has come up a couple of times in the last few weeks, and I wondered maybe whether God's trying to tell me something. Um, I'm assuming that it would be me because I know that none of you guys would be stubborn, so it's it's got to be me. I'm sure that you've all experienced the frustration of dealing with somebody who stubbornly won't see sense. It's plain as day. Anybody can see it, but they're too stubborn to see it. It's frustrating, isn't it? Jesus feels the same frustration at stubborn hearts. He wants people to know and receive God's love, but they won't, they won't accept it. Imagine God's frustration at people's stubbornness to not believe and accept his free gift, his free gift of salvation. They see the miracles, miracles that only God could perform, and yet their stubborn hearts won't accept who Jesus is. Jesus performs a miracle and the man's hand is healed. Do the Pharisees celebrate? Do they see the good? Do they see that Jesus has made this man whole? No. 
they think they see a, a threat to their positions of power and they plot to kill Jesus. I plead with you, please do not let your hearts be stubborn. Open your hearts to let God make you whole. We're up to verse 7 of chapter 3 if you're following along. Now, clearly there are a lot of people who are smarter than the Pharisees and a large crowd follow Jesus and his disciples to the lake. A crowd so big that they have to uh, plan a potential escape route through a boat uh, in case they get uh, overrun. These people have heard what Jesus is doing and they see the obvious. Jesus has genuine authority. He's healed many. The evil spirits recognise him as the son of God and Jesus tells them not to tell others. I always find it ironic that the evil spirits can see that Jesus is the son of God, but the religious leaders don't. Now, I'm not going to comment too much on the verses where Jesus appoints the 12, other than to say that even at this very early stage, we're only in chapter 3 of Mark, at this early stage, we see the importance that Jesus puts on sharing the good news. We too should have that same mindset. We should have that mindset of sharing the good news. Today's passage finishes with this reassuring story about Jesus' family. As always, Jesus is focused on the kingdom, God's kingdom. His family thinks he's out of his mind and the teachers of the law claim that he's possessed by the devil. Jesus knows what they're thinking and he's quick to point out the error of their logic. If Satan's driving out Satan, isn't that just self-defeating? It doesn't make any sense to do that. If a kingdom's divided against itself, it won't stand. It'll be defeated. If you want to plunder a strong man's house, you have to tie up the strong man first. Jesus tells them that people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter. This is the reality of the gospel. God forgives those who repent and seek his forgiveness. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. Now, verse 30 says that he said this because they were saying that he has an impure spirit. They're basically saying that Jesus is possessed by Satan. But that verse 30 is a great reminder that we need to take this passage in context. I know this passage has raised a lot of questions for a lot of people, and I don't know that I can answer all of your questions, but let me give you my take on this. Firstly, as I've already said, I believe it's absolutely vital that we read this passage in context and not just on its own. Jesus is dealing with the Pharisees who have stubborn hearts. They're claiming that Jesus is possessed by Satan, which we know is not true. We know he's the son of God. And I believe that Jesus is saying to them, they can be forgiven. All they have to do is turn to him. They can be forgiven for anything that they say or do if they repent. But if you remain stubborn and deny God, including the Holy Spirit, then you will bear the eternal consequences for that. He's telling them, don't be stubborn. God can forgive you. But if you don't turn, the consequences for you denying God are eternal. So don't remain stubborn. This section of scripture closes with this wonderful comment about God's family. It can't be made any clearer than this. If you put your trust in Jesus and do God's will, then you are God's family. We are brothers and sisters with Jesus, and we can call God our father. 
We've been adopted into his family and his kingdom. What a wonderful gift. God's kingdom is here. It's yet to be fulfilled, but it's here right now. There are only two ways to live and you need to choose. Will you be stubborn or will you put your trust in Jesus, the son of God who died and rose so that we can live forever as God's forgiven children, as heirs of his kingdom?